in the world, people have a right to be themselves. They have the right to do things. They have the right to be present with people. They have the right to apologize. They have the right to make amends. They have the right to do everything that produces peace in the world, don't they? You see, part of our problem in today's America is our lack of understanding of U.S. constitutional law. That is the fundamental thing on which all of our people in this land are basing their lives, is it not? It is the freedom to worship a higher being, a architectural designer, an inter integral uh, listener to our inter souls of our lives. It is also the opportunity to have free speech, to talk about things we like, to render our opinions on matters of importance, whether it be the importance of politics or a simplest thing of the foods that we like to eat. In the world, there are other laws in terms of our rights to not be harmed, to not be stalked, to not be put in a place of difficulty by police and other aspects of law enforcement and sheriff who don't have the right to do those things to us without some sort of just cause. We have one little problem though in this land is that we have people who lie. We have people who lie to themselves about their rights and other people's lives, and we have people who lie just to harm people's lives. We have people who lie to interfere with people's lives. We have people who lie to play games on people's lives. The liars of the land are what are destroying America. These are the people who were either born here and raised here, or the people who come here and steal here to make our lives difficult. What I mean is that they don't produce a life for themselves. They're so busy going after other people's lives and other people's livelihoods and other people's property and other people's possessions and other people's relationships and other people's networks and other people's social liaisons and other people's intimate partners that they have forgotten who they are in their individual selves. They're so busy pursuing someone that they don't realize the destruction they're causing in their own life. They don't recognize their own lie to themselves about their power in this world. Part of the reason is that they've forgotten what the forefathers wanted, was a place we could come, a place we could be, a place that we would be belonging to groups that we want to assembly with. Now, when I say it like that, I'm trying to bring out the language of the U.S. Constitution, that we have the right to assemble with other like-minded people to render our opinions and to literally be free of charges that are not founded on anything but opinion. You see, anyone can opinion that their hair is blue, even if they have none, like me. When I started to lose my hair, it was quite a loss because my hair was something that gave me pride about my lineage of having come from good quality hair people, but also for the fact that it was something that I could manage and can control about my own natural look in this universe. When my hair started to grow everywhere else, it was sort of a joy because that's what happens when a man matures in his abilities in life. He has the right to celebrate those maturing stages of his life, and we call that a passage of time. The Jewish community have sort of kept those rights, but the rest of the world have sort of lost those rights. And when I say rights, I don't mean R-I-G-H-T-S, I mean R-I-T-E-S, assuming I spelled that correctly. What I mean is that when we're talking about the right of passage, the right of becoming something, the right to journey into something else, Pardon me, it is our lawful right to do so. When I want to be myself, I just am myself. I can't stop the fact that I'm old and that I might have to do things that old people do. I can't stop the fact that I was born with a deviated septum and my nose sometimes has nasal drip. What I discovered is that when I started taking a particular product, my nasal drip pretty much ceased. Of late, I've not been able to take it as much because people were tainting that a purchase that my family was making to help ensure that I had good cellular health. When I've started to take it again, I'm starting, starting to feel myself again. When someone unlawfully interferes with our right to medications or our right to prescriptions or our right to vitamins or our right to supplements, it is an illegal act. There are food and drug administration laws that allow us the safety and quality of our food. As Americans, we certainly throw away and dispose of a lot of food. We don't always finish our meals at restaurants, and we don't always think about taking it home, particularly if it's not cool enough to stay in the car for going to a movie afterwards, or if it's just not wise to do so because there's so little left. But do we put those pieces of scraps of food 
outside for the animals to get at? Not exactly. We put it in plastic bags that makes the animals have to po open those bags if they know how, particularly like raccoons and the like, or wolves that can use their gnashing teeth or their paws and hooves to get in there. Now deer obviously don't get into those sort of things, but they might go for carrots and other things. Have restaurants ever thought about separating the meats from the vegetables and providing those things to the animals of the earth? Or are we just filling our landfills in plastic bags that don't disintegrate? Or have we gotten to a point where all of our plastic is actually biodegradable so that any bag put in the land will eventually disintegrate? When I talk about these things, I'm talking about real aspects of preserving our life on Earth. The reforestation projects going on in other countries might be something that America could learn from. We certainly have plenty of lumber mills in the upper northwest of the nation. I know because I photographed many of them, and they were amazing. They're also dangerous places to work. Trees are heavy. They can break limbs on our body. They can fall on feet. They can ruin lives. They can take away life. We know of many people who lost their lives because equipment broke. There's some wonderful shows like Man from Snowy River where that sort of thing sort of happened and a man, a young man, lost his father. He was not allowed to live on his own ranch by the elders of the community, which was sort of unlawful in that time, but they didn't take away his right to his land. When he was old enough and after his schooling and education, he returned to his land that he owned. Now, when we're talking about land ownership, we have a lot of land companies, and I wonder, how did they acquire that land? Was it passed down from generation to generation in Indiana to them, or was their family a part of land ownership and it got moved into their hands? We have many conglomerate type of companies that are now coming into the community and many that have been here a long time, and we don't really know about a lot about them. We have learned recently by going out to a fishing pier that the Indiana water companies actually own most of the rivers and lakes, and that's probably a good thing, but it doesn't prevent people who are on their boats from polluting the water, either with urine of their own self because they're out there and stuck and have to pee, or openly they're providing it to the fish to utilize in some way. It might create better algae, I have no idea, but we're not really educating our population about how to safely go places in the woods, or how to safely transverse and transgress, or what's the word I'm looking for, trek through the waterways. I've been sort of on a lineage of sorts, a passage of time, if you will, when I walk places. I will walk through lands, but I realized the other day, in the middle of the night, when I was thrown out of a vehicle by a sibling who just couldn't handle her own rage and just decided to put me out on the road in the middle of nowhere, with no coats, really, with no blankets at all, with barely any gloves, thankfully God provided some over the course of my trek, that I literally was probably walking across frozen lakes, but I didn't know because there wasn't a sign. I got the sense that it might be the case just because of how the tree lines were, how the snow hit the trees, and how much I understand a little bit from having been in scouting or just being observant of how trees grow and how tall they should be and how fat they should be at certain points. I was wise enough to walk at the edge, hang on to tree branches, which thankfully are there for us to do when we have to go places and do things around waterways. But it was a risk, and I could feel the ice cracking underneath me. I could have fallen in the drink and drowned. I could have fallen and gotten frostbite. I have frostbite. My siblings comment about the blackness on my hands. Some of it comes from gloves that are poorly manufactured in foreign countries that we sell at the dollar stores and we sell to people in winter as if they're going to keep their hands warm. They don't and we should not be selling them. They should be told to that manufacturer they are not allowed to produce those for our country and literally they might work in their country because they're not all that cold out there, but it is very rare and very difficult to find two very important aspects of winter living. We're sort of at the tail end of our winter time, but what we really need the most in this land are good quality gloves, good quality socks, and frankly, weather-resistant shoes. I have discovered through walking through the community and literally destroying several pairs of shoes by not being able to change my shoes out from living in a homeless state that in truth, the soles on most of our shoes are not warm enough to stand on the concrete when it is freezing outside. Now, most people have the luxury of an automobile or the luxury of a family member who is willing, able, and unabiding um, in their willingness to love on someone to help them get places to jobs, to school, to wherever it is 
to make sure that they are safe and warm. But when people are evil, if you will, when people are malicious, when people struggle with their own sin and rage in themselves, they can do all sorts of terrible things like throwing someone out in the cold on Christmas Eve, which literally happened to me. I thankfully had been given the prophetic wisdom to take with me a long coat that day. You see, the Lord knows the plans of all people, especially those who lie and say they're going to come back for you and have no intention of returning because they have other plans and they can lie and say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to pick you up here, but they actually make plans elsewhere. It is sort of negligence. It is sort of psychological abuse. It's certainly an emotional abuse because Christmas Eve, there was literally nothing open, not one place. I thankfully could sit outside a Goodwill store on a sofa because the Lord directed me there to find that place. I was told there'd be a sofa and I could sit on it to stay a little bit warmer by the fabric of the sofa. When I tried the same thing a few days later, some monstrous security person came over their video system telling me I couldn't sit there. What an absolute utter lie. Who would have really given a crap whether I sat there until morning? out of the elements under their overhang, protected by the fact that it was freezing rain that day. And with that chair literally right there under the overhang, I could have stayed warm a little bit better than being told to go stand in the freezing rain in the middle of the forest, where there are wolves and other things that did descend upon me Christmas Eve, and I was told it's time to get up and go. You see, in our lifetime, we have the opportunity to listen to God. We have the inability, we have the ability to listen to what's right in our minds, but we also have the ability to listen to what is wrong. What is wrong is when people think they have the right to lord over others in the middle of the night when it's freezing cold. What's wrong is when we have employees at food restaurants who think that if they get a phone call from some police officer or some other person pretending to be any person in official capacity, that they have the lawful right to taint a beverage, to put in melatonin, to put in something, a sort of diuretic to give the person diarrhea or literally a total accident in their pants. That is maliciousness and it is pure evil. The tainting of food is something we have to really be careful of today. We have all sorts of foodborne illnesses it is not exactly true, but we are at the risk of it because the people coming into our land come from countries that have different type of bacteria in their systems. They're accustomed to different types of food being preserved in different types of ways or not refrigerated in the ways that we do here. We are anal retentive about our milk and eggs, and maybe we don't have to really refrigerate everything all the time because let's face it, in days of old, they didn't have refrigerators. They only started to have ice boxes, and they also had cold stones and other things that they did things on. They cooked in their chimneys of their homes. They used pots and pot holders that they made from scratch. Everything today is not handmade, is not true. Someone at some place designed it and it's been produced and manufactured by machinery that took the place of a human hand. Now what I'm really talking about is the fact that in our lifetime we have opportunities of time to really be something for someone else. When we have excessive amounts of clothes, we take it to Goodwill or to the Salvation Army and we try to put it in a place that will take it in willingly, lovingly, hopefully wash it so that it's clean for the next person. And if they don't have laundromats attached to those buildings, they should. They really should because it would allow someone to go in, purchase an entire cart full of new clothing because they've lost weight or because they've changed their lifestyle or because they got a new job and they need different clothes and turn around walk around to the backside of the building, spend $2 in a washing machine, and literally wash all their clothes. Then dry it for another couple dollars, and then go on home. The problem is we don't have enough laundromats in our communities, is absolute truth. While it is inexpensive to buy a used washer, I mean, usually you can do that for about $500 for the pair, but if they don't have the money, if they can't afford the water bill, if they don't have a home, it's sort of hard to do laundry. When we have people at those places that lie, steal, and cheat people out of their clothing, and I've seen it happen in Southern Indiana in some of the best little laundromats there are, there's always somebody buzzing around trying to put their hands in someone else's laundry to take something either for the fun of it, the thrill of it, or they want it. It's unlawful. There needs to be signs that says, you brought your own stuff, you go home with your own stuff. This is the law. Don't dither in someone else's um, delectables, if you will and their underwear. You see, that's the craziness. When I lived in Japan, we didn't have dryers. That, not that they didn't exist, but usually it was the wealthy people that had them and they didn't work. 
I can remember I needed to produce something dry to do something either that evening or the next day. I can't remember. So I went to one of my professional liaisons, who was a doctor in the town in which I lived. He owned the entire hospital. Literally, he owned that building. He was the leading director and the leading physician of that place where people resided, a part of his home. He let me use his dryer. It barely worked. You see, in Japan, we wash our clothes in a one cycle or two step, which are difficult to use. And I never understood why people would want them and the fact that they're cheaper. But in reality, and we hung our clothes outside on rods that were already attached to our apartment complexes. Regardless of what story we lived on, there was always a line available to us. Whether I lived on the first floor in a eight Joe, Hachi Joe is what it's called, an eight to Tammy mat room, or whether I lived on, I think it was the fifth floor in a concrete building, which was horrible, but had a good layout. There was always a place to hang our laundry and no one took it. No one came into the home and stole things. And the locks on the door weren't any real different than ours. The trash that we took places for when we had festivals were brought home with us or put in public receptacles. Nowadays, you can barely find a public trash can. And that's because companies are becoming cheap. They don't want to pay for other people's garbage, but it's foolish because then we get garbage all over the road. Now, when I'm talking about things, I'm really talking about the environment. And I'm asking you, what are you doing in your own home, in your own life to recycle things? I've been throwing cans away because of a generous kindness of someone thought that I might like to have something to drink that I need to drink for my own human life, for my own taste buds, for my own caffeine intake, for my own water intake. But openly, I haven't exactly been recycling those cans because the place that I am doesn't recycle. And that's a shame. We need to have different colored trash bins, literally smaller sizes, where we can just recycle food in one. Plastics in another, cardboard in another, and cans in another, bottles in another. It might literally be that our trash cans become a five receptacle sort of thing that then fit when the machine comes around. I don't know. But we have to start looking at the longevity of our planet is absolute truth. That we've damaged our planet with industry and smoke is true. That we're harming our global system is absolute truth. That oil spills have happened in our waterways is total truth. That tsunamis still occur is truth and fact, but openly people don't think about recycling all the time in the day to day. Some families do. Some families plant trees, some families feed the homeless, but that's not the point. The point is that in life, our environment is what provides us our food. And if we're running out of farmers and we're running out of ranchers and we're running out of cow people, it's happening because we're not offering it at the earliest of ages in children's lives. We're not allowing kids to explore farms and dairies. It's not true. Most field trips go to those places, but they're not necessarily giving children enough time to be there to try to pretend to be that occupation, to get those who are really crazy about cows interested in that from the get-go, or if they love horses, to give them that chance to go learn animal husbandry, or for a chick farmer to literally turn that into a profitable business, we need other chick farmers to mentor them. You see, what really produces a life today is pretty straightforward. It's the food we eat. That is what sustains us, the water that we care for. Those are the things that we need more and more people in, in industry, I'm pretty sure. I can't be 100% factual, but let's face it, are your children willing to go off and work in fast food and other restaurants and make a living? Because there are people who work the late shifts and make a good quality living doing that work. But they have to have a really good work ethic. They have to be physically strong. They also have to tolerate a lot of people meeting a lot of folks. And that might be why they gravitate to those industries. They don't want long-term relationships to anyone other than the other employees they work with. And people come and go in those jobs a lot. So they're learning to say hello, goodbye, and stay in contact with other type of technological tools. Now, when I'm talking about the environment, what we're really talking about is not these big issues that we can't solve. It's really the homegrown issues of we have to feed ourselves. We have to protect our food and our lands from the robbers of those fields. A farmer might own many, many acres, but he can't police it all on his own. 
we need to have a new law enforcement that are on horses, literally allowed by permission of the farmers to walk through the fields to look for all sorts of things, inappropriate type of fauna that shouldn't be there, that's hidden within the field that the farmer didn't place there, that could be bothering other foods that we need to eat, strange animals that have been released because someone decided to buy an exotic and then they couldn't handle it anymore and they let it go, allowing it to procreate the earth where it doesn't belong. We need fish hatcheries that really care for the type of fish that are in there and not allow them to get plagued with illness that create problems in our food and our digestive tracts. We really need more scientists to look at food is probably true, but I don't know the information on that. But I bet you politicians can access that information. They can share it with the world. You see, what produces a life worth living is really our food and our beverages. The beverages we put in our body and the balance in which we utilize it, including importance of water, help us to produce our digestive system. And for those people who are overweight, maybe they're drinking the wrong things. You see, God in heaven can teach them what beverages are perfect because God created it all. Something that I have found absolutely fascinating is that I can walk into a store and God will direct me to different products and help me avoid other products. And when I test the system, when I say, you know, I'd really like to try that anyway, God proves to me that he was absolutely right, that that particular brand is too salty for me. Or that particular taste doesn't go with my taste buds. When I talk about beverages, I know what I can and can't drink anymore. I know my own system. I know my own food allergies. I know what types of ethnic foods I can and cannot eat. Now, other people I love and trust might like those food things, and I can try and find something on the menu, but only if the proprietor is thinking about all people who come to their restaurant and that not everyone can handle spicy and just maybe they should have a, just one or two items that are completely spice free. So that anyone with salt or pepper or other types of spice intolerances can enjoy eating a meal with their friends and their family, their colleagues at a restaurant. We have to really look at that. I've noticed that since the Hispanic population have come more and more into our fast food restaurants, that we're getting spicier and spicier type of versions of food. And it might just be that that employee is not following the recipe and is just doing it their way. There was a commercial, Have It Your Way, and it is about our life. You see, making a life worth living is about having the food that we need. And our future health in our elder years, as our cells decay and die, literally aging our bodies, graying our hair, making us less able and a little bit more feeble, are based on many times, not only genetics, but how the food we choose for those genetics work in our system. My faith fobs are simple. Unfortunately, many of the bags have been destroyed by people at Impound who had no lawful right to get into them. A lot of the cards have been taken out of a lot of the things I created, wanting to make sure I had a product of all different price points, based on what it cost me to put them together, and what I felt their value is to someone else. Some things are break even, other things are not. But my point is that a faith fob that I produce, or that you produce, or that you utilize on your own to help with your spirituality can help you to produce a healthier body. But you have to have a willingness to submit your life, your food intake, your beverage intake to the Lord. And in my case, I have officially lost 14 inches off my body which means I have no clothes that fit. I've literally gone from a 46 jacket down to a 36 type of jacket, possibly less than that. One of my new coats is 38 and it fits pretty good, but it allows me to put a little bit of layering on in the winter. My point is that by doing this system, I have thinned down. I feel healthier. I feel more able to control my physical being. I feel less clumsy. I trip less. I bump into things less because I fit my bones. Now, people come in all shapes and sizes. Genetic, genetics literally produced for us our height, sometimes our weight, definitely our body types. And I often joke about the fact that when I was looking for a college love long ago, just to peek in on her life, just for a moment to see if she was happy, if she had produced offspring or anything like that, that I literally went to Facebook. I typed in the name of her husband with her name. I typed it in and from a thumbprint, I mean a thumbprint, you know what a thumbprint is? We all get them on photos. A thumbprint image of a family photo. I could pick her out 
of all of the people with her same name. But it wasn't actually her that I picked out. She was standing behind a daughter who literally stood precisely the same way she did. And I recognized that when I went home with her uh, to Baltimore when we were in college, that her mother stood the same way. You see, some of these things are learned. Other than other things are based on our body types, and that's the reality. I am a small statued man, but I have many people who think that I'm pretty tall based on my beliefs, based on my philosophy, based on what I can do with my own faith fobs, and frankly, that's my legal right. Underneath world human rights, underneath national rights and civil rights of the U.S. Constitution, I have the right to my faith, just like you. But my faith produces amazing magical results. What about yours? Have you discovered the magic of the Lord, is my question, from all of this. But more importantly, a life worth living and retirement worth having is totally based on our food intake, the beverages that we consume, and how we care for our body. Now, I'm not going to get on a don't smoke campaign or a don't drink campaign or any of those sort of things. We've all been through health class in 7th and 8th grade, ninth grade. We know what those things can do to our bodies. We know that people do have these vices. We know that. But the truth is, for the people who really want to survive longer, who want to have healthier lifestyles, who want to do things to protect the earth, we do need gardeners. My sister gardens profusely. Her homeowners association craps all over her for it. But you know what? It saves her money at the grocery store, and she has the lawful right to do that. When she moved in here, there was not this ridiculousness of other people trying to control what she could do in her yard. I realize that we have to have some controls for some uniformities, but not really. When a person purchases the land, purchases the house, it's theirs. They shouldn't have to live out in the countryside to do what they like in their own property. Now I'm talking about property ownership, but really we're talking about land caretaking. We know that my sister's plot of land actually probably has higher value than other people in her neighborhood. The very simple reason is that she can produce food for herself if she loses a job. She can eat the fruit on her trees, the vegetables in her garden, and possibly even the rabbits running around in her backyard, unless there's some law about that. I don't believe she has a gun, and that's probably wise, but there are other ways to catch a rabbit, I'm sure. In the olden days, we would eat that sort of game before we got domesticated animals and before we went to quality control things. And there's a wonderful film that Claire Danes was in where she played a person with autism who loved cows and literally could, in essence, feel what was going on for those animals, and she changed the entire industry. Now, where do you think she got her gifts from? The Lord. The magic of the Lord is always with us. It is always around us. It is always something that lives and breathes like they said in this film that I love the most from childhood. And my Star Wars figures are hopefully still in storage from when I was six and seven years old to give to my own future children. But the reality is that the force flows through us, around us, and within us. Some of my faith fobs are from the Catholic faith, which literally talk about how Christ is above, below, beside, behind, and in front of our lives. In your life, who produces the food that you eat is important. Who, sues, who serves the food at a table in a restaurant is vitally important. Paying attention to what they do to you when you visit a restroom in a public food establishment is incredibly essential in the Fisher's community. You want to really pay attention to when you walk into those places of what property you have on you and what property you leave with. There's all kinds of ways that people use science to ruin other people's freedoms. But today we're talking about the environment, really. We're talking about the importance of food production, of animal health, of horse husbandry to help us to protect our foods from the infidels, the illegals, and the malicious who want to come to America to destroy us, to give power to their own nations. Thanks for listening. This has been Blake Ensign of Blaze Communications, LLC, the author of Soul Keepers, The Soul Strings of Our Lives, and other works like Pendulum Practice, 
and the writer of the upcoming film, The Dragon Priest. Thanks for listening.